um, when you would hear these students talk, um, it would always come up, what interested you in architecture? Um, did it just happen? Did it come from, uh, uh, you know, deep inside or, or is it things you've seen? And that has always fascinated me. And um, so I decided uh, when I was doing the book to take a look back and just see what, uh, what may have influenced um, um, a kid who grew up in the Highlands uh, to become an architect. And then we will see some of the projects uh, that we've uh, done um, over the years. Um, the, the book was a really rewarding project. You got, uh, got to revisit friends, um, meet a lot of new and talented people. Um, and um, even though it took a couple of years, it, it was uh, actually a really interesting process. So a lot of architects out there, you might wanna pursue that. So I begin uh, the book back uh, um, and we'll begin looking at these um, just with the, uh, my earliest years and pretty much I was a kid of the Highlands. Um, I grew up there, uh, the neighborhoods around Bardstown Road um, from uh, inner Louisville, uh, actually to pretty far out were, were my stomping ground. Um, and I actually live there today. So um, and, and a lot of you won't. So let me, uh, what have I done? <laughs> what did I do? There we go. There we go. Louisville in the 60s and 70s. Um, the architecture of the, the rolling hills, people picture the highlands of mostly for its green space. Um, you see here some of the mid-century houses, uh, the use of materials. This is a Norman Sweet House at the top of a Nolan and Nolan House on Millvale. Um, actually a partial spec house over on Saratoga. Um, you see the colors and images um, of, of the churches, which were the major buildings. This is uh, uh, actually St. Raphael. Uh, this is Emmanuel United Church of Christ on Taylor's Road. I know a lot of people have seen it. Um, as a kid, it was absolutely a, a fascinating building that a church could look like that, especially a church in a city with so many wonderful historic churches. The, oh, okay. Um, early neighborhoods of the Highlands, or I should say more of the outer lay, uh, neighborhoods were just filled constantly, interspersed with houses like these. You've all seen them. Um, they, were, they would be located in between kind of the cookie cutter houses that people would see over time. Um, I always thought they were fascinating. They were influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, pretty much the only architect people knew of in the day and pretty much the only one they know of today. Um, <laughs> The, there were small buildings, um, not, not big monumental buildings. This, this was the, kind of the family savings bank. Um, it's across from Costco now, uh, but it was an early use of concrete. Uh, it had a really neat banking hall. Um, the, uh, to actually enter the banking hall, you crossed a moat of water, which was great as, as a kid. And you could also win a free 23 inch GE television. Um, right up the street, um, this is across from Costco. It's now uh, kind of been gutted and covered. Um, but um, a, a, a stunning building built with um, a, a concrete frame. Um, you notice the Brisolet enclosed an entirely glass building. Um, and some people here will remember it, uh, but I thought it was very uh, appropriate at the time that there's something new uh, coming to Louisville. Another project, um, as, as the youngest or in really young years, um, used to climb on this as a boy. Um, out south of Seneca High School, um, a gentleman built, uh, uh, his name was Mr. Eggleston, a house that was basically a fallout shelter. Um, this occurred during 
um, you know, the, those were just the times of the world. Um, this article um, and some of the work was uh, taken from Louisville Magazine, um, uh, their archives. And um, I, I tried to find it to leave copies just because it's so fascinating, but I couldn't find it again because of their uh, demise. But this man actually built this over a period, of, I think six years. Um, he built a silo and raised the house built this steel frame over time, just, just piece by piece. I, I think as he got the money together, um, the, it had a, a, a deck going around it. Um, there were, the only access was through like a porthole and he walked up this really interesting, almost like bunks to get to the top. Um, he generously left a handmade ladder, which, uh, which the kids uh, would use because he would lock the porthole to get into the thing. I just showed this because of at a really young age, you learn that a house can look like what you want it to look like. So it, it was uh, quite interesting and it stayed with me. Uh, uh, bits and pieces of this are still out there surrounded by siding, uh, a little small um, house that sits there now. And of course, Louisville had wonderful complexes um, of, of older buildings, wonderful older neighborhoods. Uh, I was, was interested in Bruce Goff's Triero House uh, out past Fern Creek. Um, one of my favorite projects and no one else's favorite project um, was Founder Square. Um, it, uh, a small building that uh, sits um, down on Fist or sat down on Fist Street, kind of across from the cathedral. It, it basically uh, had a, this small suspended concrete roof you would walk in and there was a gentleman at the desk who said, welcome to Louisville. It, it was a folly. It uh, had restrooms that were downstairs, down a 30 inch wide uh, staircase. So, um, but it actually made, helped to make a, a, a green space better. And if you go down and look at uh, what that little park looks like today, uh, this would have been uh, better if it had somehow remained. So um, briefly, uh, in college, it was extremely interesting, um, wonderful professors, uh, the best education you get. I just show this because it was a very tactile uh, environment, a lot of art, a lot of drawing, um, and very interesting projects that we would work on. Trips to Europe um, consisted of constant drawing, um, you had teachers uh, from Peter Carl to Herb Green for the architects in the office. Um, after college, uh, I show this building um, uh, because I work for um, one of the city's finest and, and, uh, uh, and he just passed away. His name is Kay Norman Berry, uh, a, a wonderful gentleman, uh, but I was an intern in his office. Um, and, and I remember the uh, very first internship the first week myself and another intern got walked down the river city mall in the middle of january and he looked up and he said uh, you two need to measure this building and th this was in the day when uh you pretty much use a tape measure and yourself so uh, we were young architects we were appalled we thought this was like we're not it, it's big um so <laughs> Uh, luckily, we're, there was some repetition, but for two months, we were among the pigeons, the broken glass, the freezing temperatures. Um, and when it was finished, uh, 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 shortly after that, um, the actor bought the building, and I forgot his name. Um, that's, that's, that's right. Roger Davis bought the building and, uh, and, and did the renovation. But um, I just bring that up because that's that's what you get in a in this type of profession. So um, I had the opportunity. Uh, Joanna and I uh, got to live in the Palm Beach area of Florida. Very young firm, uh, just two guys and myself. They were very busy. Uh, this was the first project I did. It was a guest house and a garage and a pool on the Loxahatchee River. Joanna and I visited this a couple years ago, and it actually still looks like it does. Uh, today. So, so the projects um, after all this um, going kind of going through the 
early days of the projects. Uh, or I'll show you a mix of houses and um, uh, just a few to, to go through. Uh, I'd like to mention that our houses were are very, uh, and our projects for the most part are very site specific. Um, the, the Highlands neighborhoods where a, a lot of them exist and are, um, you know, there are no large suburban open sites. You, you build with constraints and you make the best uh, thing that you can. You, you make those constraints something beneficial. So, so I'll start and, and just show you these. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, uh, interrupt or ask. Um, the Axton House sits um, on a Highland site that is, uh, while it looks kind of simple, uh, it actually borders a uh, nursing home, a community center, and a Southern colonial house that was built two foot within the uh, property line where it shouldn't be. So it also is a very steep site. So it, it's hard to do something like uh, uh, that is really noteworthy when you have this huge nursing home next door. But uh, uh, we also will utilize, and you'll see these, and I'm not gonna go into them a lot, but the architectural sketches, uh, the art, um, some of these sketches relate directly to the project. Others were just um, the kind of the art or the interest uh, that I and, and others had uh, during that day, uh, during the particular period when it was being built. For privacy, this house has a wonderful wall that actually extends from the outside into the house. The plans of our houses are, are mostly open. Um, some have almost no doors on the interior. Uh, a lot of materials used in the Highlands houses are very interesting. Uh, this house has copper, brick, um, what it looks like from the front. You actually enter the house and you pass under a small bridge, which connects two little suites upstairs. dining room, again, the entry into the main room. The back of the house sits at the base of these wonderful terraces um, that's a slate roof. And that's what all those windows on the back overlook. And it is absolutely uh, wonderful. It, it's actually a, 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 an operating uh, uh, creek bed. And so the, the, the water is controlled, but it's quite beautiful. The Bland House sits on um, five acres near Fisherville on a heavily wooded and an inclining site. It falls from this point to this point. It's approached um, up this long, narrow road. And the house itself, because of the topography, the screening of the neighbors, et cetera, uh, pretty much sits in the middle, it developed as a series of pavilions that stepped up the hill. So basically the house is a place to sleep, a place to live, a place for your car, and a workshop um, for race cars, which is, which they have some really cool ones. Above are two small suites that span the living space. So the house kind of uh, extends out over the landscape, a concrete wall, extends up from where uh, limestone um, and, uh, um, and camps were. Um, you can see the small pavilions um, as they kind of step up the hill. Uh, the transition between pavilion and pavilion um, is it kind of an interesting walk through architecture. This is what it looks like sitting on the front deck. The entry, you go up and around the concrete to the stair, living areas. On the second floor, the two little suites are connected by this bridge um, and the concrete form actually comes out over and, and uh, welcomes you in back to the family side or to, to their office actually. The detail of the sides. The Deary House sits above Big Rock in Cherokee Park. Um, 
a lot of the house has been there a long time, but a lot of people have never even seen it because it's tucked up in the hills. Um, this is somewhat literal, but literal, but here's Big Rock and the sketch shows the house uh, simply orienting down um, the Creek Valley. Um, the views are quite outstanding. You can almost see the golf course. Um, the site itself was the last site um, that Frederick Law Olmsted's office designed in Louisville. And um, the people next door had owned it and they didn't even realize that it was uh, an actual Olmsted designed uh, site. Again, the house is open, uh, uh, consists of various solids and voids, uh, a large living area. It's what it looks like from the park view. It's a steel frame building. This is entry, days and nights view of the building. Um, it's almost like a tree house. Uh, when you're in here, you're, you're pretty much above everything and, and the views are absolutely wonderful. This is actually an office that you can see the golf course all the way down. Uh, this is the very screening that you see. Um, this is a great place for casual uh, dining. I show this kitchen because uh, it's really interesting kitchen made of interesting materials. Uh, but the owner of this house was from Spain and this, she would make paella and this counter would just be filled with paella of, of, of just fruit and vegetables. It was just absolutely wonderful. This is the master uh, or the uh, primary suite upstairs. It has a deck. Uh, the owners were in the, the international wine business. And so on the first back to the first main level of uh, tucked off as an alcove is their wet bar. And um, he would set up for a lot of international visitors his wine and uh, just have a little fun. Uh, we opened the wine cellar below. And he, and he would lay bottles so you could mix a drink and look down uh, below, which was, uh, which was fine if you had uh, too much to drink. So <laughs> the Fisher house sits off of US 42. You've probably driven by it a million times and don't even know it's there uh, at, near the Woodstone intersection. It sits up on a, a very commanding hillside. Um, again, these are the living areas. Uh, separated by certain volumes. Their three daughters have three bedrooms upstairs and a really nice common space. This is the house in the evening. This is an earlier house. Inside, very wide house, a really nice art collection. This is a Ken Van Rowan sculpture, uh, adds a lot of color and interest to the rooms. The entry, the little passageways. This was a photograph taken on a rainy day uh, before they got their, their new furniture, which is really cool and better than this furniture. But you can see how much light actually um, comes in on a rainy day, how the sculpture changes shape. This is the German Carter House on Eastern Parkway. Um, a computer rendering that shows. Um, various planes and some of the organizational features. This was a, a very, very tight site, as you can imagine. Um, a house had pretty much imploded on itself. Uh, so we had to use the existing, at least the existing footprint for the foundation. So it, the house plan is very simple. Um, it consists of an entry level with a little guest suite, uh, one large living space, and one large sleeping bathroom space. Um, the only doors in this house are to, to the two small bathrooms. And there, um, on the main living floor there, on the, on the bedroom floor, actually up top, there are none. So the context, this, this is the evening. They had parties on this deck in the rear, which was nice. The house has 
really wonderful views of the Eastern Parkway. You can see St. James, it's like it's in your window. Since it was oriented north-south to let lighting during the day, a clear story was added in the middle of the house. Uh, when you go to the second floor, it's a very dramatic stair. Um, the house is wrapped around a brick wall that is on the interior of the house. Uh, and you pass in and out of that brick wall. You turn and you enter the bedroom. You can see the light well beyond. That's the bathroom beyond the glass. Um, so you almost never need to turn lights on um, in the building. Uh, this is a house on the lowest of the low beaches in Louisville, Juniper Beach. Um, the grade was about eight inches above the standard Ohio River level, which you knew was not a good situation. So um, the actual idea sketch came from um, uh, the, the owner's house was destroyed by a, a, a really bad fire. And, and they always had decks with landscaping. Um, they would occasionally be ruined uh, during the floods. And the request was that they have a garden. Um, and I'm like, well, it would be fine until you have floods. Uh, but this site floods two times a year in a normal year. Um, and on other occasions, uh, uh, more. So it, it's a rectilinear house. It actually is four levels. Uh, it's, it's your garage and boat, there's an elevator. And then there is a floor that is not is still in the floodplain and that became concrete floor exercise. The main living area and then an actual hanging garden that sits off the back of the house and a couple of smaller guest suites and game room upstairs. So this is a view from Juniper Beach. You can see the concrete construction. This is the house from the riverside and you can see the garden um, it actually holds four and five feet of dirt. A really interesting sculptural stair. This is a view of the garden as you walk out the back. And uh, kind of a straight on shot from the river I always thought was interesting. This gives you general views of the uh, extensive concrete work. To build this house, um, the concrete was actually brought in on barges uh, up the Ohio River and they would dig and uh, pump into the piers that actually hold uh, uh, the actual base of the concrete, but it was all done from the river and not um, from the road itself. So it was... see it. <laughs> Views of the rooms upstairs. Um, they picked all the colors. They had a strange sense of, that just gives you an idea. It looks like you're almost on the river, but you're 27 feet above. The Goman House sits on um, several hundred acres near Lanesville, Indiana. It is actually approached on a small road that at the time was through an active cornfield. And then you go through a series of pine trees and the house, the property now is here, uh, but the house sits not at the crest of the hill, but close to the crest. And you actually venture past the house. The floor plan of the house consists of a series of pavilions, um, again, um, sleeping, living, and family room. Um, there's a large art studio here. Small bedrooms span the entry. Um, I mixed in some seasonal photographs because it's kind of fun to see the house at, at spring and uh, in the fall. Uh, but so when you actually enter that little road, you actually come past and, and you get to go all around the house. Uh, this is the first view that you see of it. Um, springtime view of the back of the house. Uh, it is built of major wall components are Indiana limestone. Um, and 
all of the rooms have glass pretty much that, that overlook the really beautiful valley. Um, since the owners were in the construction business and we had set the house down, you actually enter the house um, across this little bridge. Come through the door and this is their entry hall. And then the house drops a few levels to get you to our grade. They have a wonderful art collection throughout. And so you can see the glass wrapping around here, not in curvilinear fashion, but in the little pavilions. Um, the, the limestone is absolutely beautiful. Close-ups, a lot of art in this house. Um, this just shows a really nice place to eat outside. You can see the art collection and uh, the sculpture is by Noel Goleman, who's a noted uh, artist and teacher in Louisville. And uh, she made the models. Uh, she and Mike did not cut and lift those pieces into place. Um, they assured me. Um, this was an interesting project uh, for Rick Heath and Mary Lee Rossini, who a lot of you know. It was an addition to their house, and they wanted a house that was an art gallery. So everything but the sleeping in the kitchen. So it was a 1950s house that overlooks Goose Creek. This is the view out of the addition. You see a stair down to the lower level gallery. But the, the actual space took second place to the, the wonderful collection of, of glass art uh, that's kind of world renowned. I think they had, they had one chair in the living area. So you, you, you kind of sit there among the wonderful art. So. Um, a couple of other buildings. Um, this is for Assumption High School. This was their arts and sciences building, a, a fascinating chance to add to a 1950s building. Um, instead of having hallways, um, it became uh, more or less light-filled galleries. Um, Another building for Assumption um, was taking their gymnasium and turning it into a 300 seat theater. The 300 seats would accommodate one class and their teachers. Um, throughout our years of work, uh, we did a lot of work through models uh, made of every material and I haven't really gone into them because, um, uh, but there were uh, countless hours put in on these um, these pieces uh, still have some and they're uh, kind of fun to look at every now and then. This shows the theater insertion in the 1950s gym. Um, when it was built, um, the steel framework actually had to be installed um, while school was going on. So they were inside the building digging holes because the weight of the theater couldn't be held by the, you know, the gym floor, uh, but it was an abstract series of these columns that extended through the floor of the gymnasium. Um, now they had all this planned out and they're, they're still planning the architect for their new building is here. Um, the, uh, to get 300 seats, um, they requested a theater that was not a high school theater, but one that if possible was the a proscenium thrust um, and black box, which is hard to combine, but those are the three theater types, but they, they wanted a, a, a collegiate building and not a high school building. So this gives you the idea of the interior. A lot of pieces uh, for acoustics. The area around the theater is a series of galleries. You actually go up a ramp and steps to get to the main level of the theater which further heightens the interest. Just views of the surrounding areas. Um, another small building for them is uh, between Bardstown and Newburgh Road uh, called Assumption Green. It's their athletic facility. Uh, small, oddly shaped building. This is the locker rooms. This was a, a true project with the girls uh, because they are, were getting involved in environmental design. So um, 
view at night. It features a series of green walls, which the girls began to learn. It has a classroom um, that they offer, uh, uh, not environmental studies, some of their science classes. Uh, uh, a section of Beargrass Creek runs through it, so they get to learn and see that. The, so the building was made with a lot of uh, recyclable materials. You actually enter the complex um, to the left are the locker rooms and to the right is the service uh, shop, et cetera. Um, the roof on this and uh, a lot of the buildings are it's fairly complicated in that they use solar panels, green roof sections, solar orientation, uh, the athletic field is uh, over here is, is environmentally, environmentally friendly as, uh, as made nowadays. The building uh, pretty much can be turned off for the months that it's not used. It uses, or for a few months it's not used, it uses really no energy. Uh, all the big field lights are still on lg &E, so. Um, about to wrap up here. This is a small office building out Highway 146, almost near the county line. Uh, for a developer, um, the site was going to be a speedway, a gas station. And then it was going to be a Walgreens, which are America's two favorite buildings of choice. And uh, a small development company uh, purchased it. Uh, for their little office building. It's uh, 8,000 feet here, several thousand in the basement. This was for an, a husband and wife team. It's a husband, wife, had a little shared office. Um, they actually wanted it to be more like a house and they wanted a front porch, which was different for an office building, but it uh, turned out to be good, you know, the past couple of years. So um, they were very uh, sensitive to the landscaping. They actually had the folks from Udell come over and uh, there were a lot of elms that had to be taken down and, uh, but they have a, a really nice plan to replant the site. So it sits on a, a small plinth. It's very low lying. Simple offices. Um, they were letting some of the people do what they want in their office till that got out of hand. So I, I got called back in. Like, yeah. A lot of our projects are unbuilt. Um, this is for the Dominican Sisters South uh, uh, near Springfield, a small chapel. And I show this just uh, again to bring in how we would work with models. Um, to actually work in the development of, of the design. Sometimes they would help for fundraising in certain projects. Various ways it took. I'll leave this up for a second. Um, these are kind of older projects, but they're still around in some way, shape or form. And if you get all three, you get a free book. But um, this was part of the renovation of um, not renovation, but the, the beginnings that come back of the Lexington Road area. Uh, this was the entry into old Louisville. Um, it's not in great condition anymore. And this is actually uh, Worth Plaza, uh, which, uh, what's a restaurant? Uh, where Ceviche is. So this is what these two look like uh, pretty much the day they were finished. Uh, um, the first, uh, it was kind of fun to be a part of the, the one of the earliest buildings when Bardstown Road was just getting started on its renovation. Um, the, the Bristol had started work, uh, but um, in Worth Plaza, this gentleman um, idea for his store was uh, Australian clothes and shoes and hats and, and all the stuff from Australia. And we're like, I'm not sure if people in Louisville really want that, especially on Bargetown Road, but there were 3,000 feet of the stuff. And, and he didn't think he was getting enough business. And, he, and at the corner of Bargetown and Stevens, 
um, he called me and, and said, I have friends that are making a 13 foot can 13 foot tall kangaroo that he was going to set out on a corner. And either fortunately or unfortunately, it, it didn't last that long, but I, I, I was on the okay side. I was like, oh, so, but, um, but there was nothing on Bardstown road at this time. So it's, it's kind of interesting to have, uh, been there. Project I would have liked to see built right up the street, one of Louisville's great buildings. Um, you don't really see it, you, you pass by it, uh, but it's Memorial Auditorium, a couple blocks. Uh, the goal here was a, an urban center of uh, art and design. Um, you've been to Savannah, you've been to these cities, Baltimore has it, um, but these were um, people who were looking at this, um, thinking kind of big, but it would really help that part of downtown. So in general, the block across along Kentucky Street between 4th and 3rd would become a 300 space parking garage to support Memorial Hall, uh, Memorial Auditorium. A new arts building would be constructed and it would run literally center line from there to the door of the free public library. So here's the building. This is the new raised plinth. This is everybody having fun. This became a bus, bus stop and a gallery entrance and some other. Um, but for the first time, you get to see the, one of the nicest facades um, in Kentucky that just kind of sits there. Uh, I don't even think the building is air conditioned nowadays or on, only parts of it are. So. entry and then all the way down to the library through Spalding, tying together various buildings, etc. Interspersing further buildings down uh, just to tie that area somewhat like this is part of Sobro, but to tie it more to, to the uh, heart of Louisville. Last project I'll show is a chapel of uh, St. Mary Elizabeth Hospital. Um, it sits at an interstitial space, again, not seen from the street. Uh, you would go by the hospital and uh, like a lot of our projects, you don't even know they're there. Um, but it sits at the uh, conjunction of the main entry to the hospital, the emergency department of the hospital and the main office building. So it was a very important site. Um, just to give you a, a quick story, the uh, one of the gentlemen at the hospital said uh, that's a, that site out there really needs to be something so the people can go out. And, and he said, can you um, like run to Lowe's and look at those little pavilions that, that you can buy that people can sit in? So th they had the right idea about uh, uh, doing something, but uh, on a temporary basis uh, wasn't a good idea. Um, the last sister of charity of Nazareth uh, came up after and said, let's do something nice. And so I was all for that. And so it's a, it's a place of con, uh, contemplation. This is the entry into the other chapel or to their interior chapel with us here. It's based on the stations of the cross and certain elements of the sisters of charity charters. Changes over light and day. These are simple steel piers. They sit, um, there's some really nice little benches in between. And that's what it looks like at night. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions, comments? very much, Michael, for a wonderful presentation. Very fascinating. A lot of things we recognize, a lot we don't. And if you would come forward, if you have a question, uh, if you come forward to the mic to ask it so everybody can hear. Um, geez, Steve. Um, I was really lucky and all of our contractors were very good, but 
of, of all the houses over the years, uh, we never had the same builder build a house. It, it just turned out this way. People either knew. So we, we didn't really have a chance to, to just uh, the, to them, it was something new, usually something new and different, and they really got involved and they really enjoyed it. Um, but we had to be there a lot. Uh, so I'm, I'm complaining and I'm not complaining, but we had a, but uh, that's just, that, that's just kind of the way it turned out. Uh, some of the commercial buildings used uh, work with Sullivan and Cozart, uh, the, all the larger projects, uh, uh, work with the large, uh, some larger projects not shown here, but we did work with, uh, Sullivan and uh, Weir, uh, all the big ones, especially on the, but the, but the smaller guys uh, be surprised when carpenters get to get a chance, you know, it'd be like them working on this. They, they really uh, uh, show special effort and interest just because it's something different. Next question over here, Michael, I think the lights Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I have two questions, really. The first one is when did computer graphics really start to make an inroad into the architecture? Because we've seen in the old movies, show people the little slide rules and all that stuff. Right. And I wondered when that started because the uh, graphical user interface, I think, was in the 70s. But when did it really start to make an impact? Um, it's really a good question, and we were actually talking about it. Uh, when I was a junior at UK in 1977, I think, um, they approached us, and some of uh, uh, comrades here who were there at the same time, uh, uh, they told us about a new thing, which was called computer-aided drafting. Whoa. Now, it, it, it wasn't really new. It had been around in some format for... Uh, uh, a few years, like you said, and it, and it went back further for aircraft design and other things, but uh, it was computer aided drafting mm -hmm. and it was actually offered at least at Kentucky and Ohio State and other schools when it first came about as at their at their technical school. So the actual drafting room, you had to walk over to the Lexington Technical Institute away from the architecture buildings because I think they thought it was beneath us. Um, but it was taught as a technical class, uh, and th that was at least kind of the, the beginnings and in, in, in orientation. Um, for us, probably within two or three years, um, I, I guess from like 1980 or so on, we actually utilized computers as almost, uh, uh, I I'd say, 60-80%, and then later on, uh, like most firms, it, it's uh, you know, 90%, a lot of architects do, do a lot of hand sketching and, and that, but uh, for now, uh, uh, computers are the way uh, everybody thinks. And, uh, um, and then um, I think the computer-aided design later became CAD computer-aided design and drafting or computer-aided drafting was, was added to. But. As a cradle Catholic, um, when the, <laughs> chapel was built and then it, they turned the hospital over to what U of L. Yes. Did they keep the cross and all the historic, the religious trappings? Um, I think the stations of the cross were removed. Mm -hmm. um, I assume the, the, the cross stayed there. Um, the, uh, uh, the sister who actually uh, uh, the, the religious order that owned the hospital has 20 hospitals are incorporated into the largest not profit hospital company in the country. Mm -hmm. She was a wonderful, smart woman. Uh, but for some reason in Louisville, they didn't quite uh, take on. But uh, so she was the last sister out there. Yeah. And she was kind of a part of all their other hospitals combining just, just to ma be ma more managed like a real hospital. Mary and Elizabeth makes no sense to me. I want to say Mary and Elizabeth, who? <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anything else? No, anyone else with a question? No, I've been asked to look at my phone in case Zoomers have texted in, but looks like no one has. And <laughs> and so you have a question, sir? Okay. Um. 
I actually have a whole story about that, but it would take a long time. Some of the people here have seen it. Uh, we live in um, a 1955 house in the Highlands um, that we have always kind of lived in the neighborhood. We walked by and it, it had gone into a state of disrepair. It borders Cardinal Hill, the old big white mansion um, in the Seneca Gardens area. Across the street and around the corner are, I think, two or three Stratton Hammond houses. We looked directly across in, into a couple of those really um, nice houses. Um, so over the past five years, we have fixed that house up, uh, by actually seven years or so. Um, it, it, I wish I had pictures. It, it, it's a red brick house. Uh, 1955 was really early, uh, designed by Charles Bayless of Bayless and Gray in Lexington. Um, and Stratton Hammond, who, who a lot of people know here, was a somewhat uh, cantankerous person. Uh, the two sisters, uh, there were two sisters who built the house. One floor is like pretty close to the other. Um, they dismissed Stratton Hammond and he actually sued the architect. And uh, I have big newspaper articles and clippings. People that have been to our house uh, have seen them. So it was a big controversy uh, uh, at the time. Um, but uh, it, it, it's a red brick house. It's, it's uh, over by Cardinal Hill. Feel free to stop by. I mean, people walk by it all the time. And you go, well, Joanna's out in the yard going in. You know, it's like, it's built in 1954. It's, it's the only kind of red brick contemporary house uh, uh, mid-century in, in uh, it's actually in the neighborhood of Seneca Gardens. I have one, I'll put you kind of on the spot. Do <laughs> uh, you have a particular favorite that you design that you always like to go back and think about? Uh, no. No? <laughs> that's a, that's no. a good uh, diplomatic answer, Michael. No. no. <laughs> Uh, I would just say, uh, you can see our, our, that over the years, just a lot of our clients and even our institutional clients um, kind of appreciated art. Um, even if they weren't artists, they appreciated, uh, uh, they, they looked at all different kinds of arts, not just um, drawing, but uh, theater and different things. And they all were very anxious to, uh, you know, look kind of beyond uh, what was done normally. So. And thanks to them, you know, I pretty much like them all. And uh, I've been retired for a few years now. Um, so uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.